Hi, Bill. How are you doing today? Robin, it feels like it's been forever. I'm great, man. How are you? Oh, life has been good. It has been forever in a day. We've it pretty has. much taken a month off from podcasting because life has just got hectic and, well, things have been busy, but what's sure. been keeping your attention over these past few weeks? Well, there's been a few things. So of course, take a little time to recharge the battery. And I did have that mm -hmm. opportunity, got to travel across the ocean a little bit and see some places that I've never seen before. But, you know, it's not just enough to take a little bit of time off doing that. So I thought, you know, what the heck? do some international travel, <laughs> come back and rest for a day, and then head over to Black Hat. So we spent some time at Black Hat as well. Uh, really, really good. We'll have some things to talk about maybe in the next episode that we get together, but uh, it was a great time. How about you, Robin? What have you been up to? Well, over the, the past month, I've made a conscious decision to reconnect with the individual self. So no social media, that's no LinkedIn, no Facebook, no Reddit, no Twitter, and instead focus on something that's near and dear to my heart. Secure access service edge. Oh, Sassy. Absolutely. So I've spent the past month writing a book about Sassy. I saw somebody, that. Yeah, so you can find that on Amazon and uh, all your local good bookshops coming soon. So if you want to know what Secure Access Service Edge is, if you want to know the components, if you want to know how it fits together, why it's important, and more importantly, why you need it, all of that info is in the book. Yeah, now, but Robin, the big question that comes up is, isn't this going to be vendor-centric? I mean, <laughs> I'm a little biased. I, I, what, what do you say about that? <laughs> uh, I, I say you're a good wingman, and I think we need to go out for drinks together. Uh, yeah, that that's the thing that kind of annoyed me. I know we are both employed by Cato Networks, and many people will see our perspective as being very biased and very skewed. However, and this is a big however, the material out there in the world shouldn't be that way. You and I, we're educators, we're enablers. If we're going to talk about a latest breach or a security incident or a framework, we really want to focus just on the technology itself. And of when course. I looked out there at all of the books and all of the material about SASE, it was very vendor skewed and vendor oriented. And right. lots of vendors will try and explain exactly what they're trying to achieve, but aligned with their narrative. And many times, hey, that's fantastic. You know, here at Cato, we do the same. We explain why single vendor SASE architecture is the best. We explain why converged architecture is the best. Sure. However, other vendors will also try and skew that narrative even in the wrong direction. So when it came to writing this book, I decided to not focus on any vendor at all. I'm not talking about Cato, not talking about Fortinet or any of the other pretenders out there. Instead, just focus on the good old technology and have a fun time doing it. So yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a wild ride. This is the first book, but I've got a feeling it won't be the last. I'm, hmm. I suspected that as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, an, it's addictive. You know, you start making music or you start acting or making videos and you think, yeah, this is fun. Of because course. if you don't spend enough time having fun in your life, then it becomes a drudgery. That's yeah, true. Well, if you find a job you're passionate about, find a vocation you're passionate about, and then once you find that passion, it doesn't become work anymore. It becomes right. just yet another day in paradise. That's right. Well, I'm looking forward to more of your authoring, and I know you can turn it out pretty quickly, especially since you're not having to use things like WordPerfect anymore. There's a blast from the past <laughs> for everybody. <right? laughs> no, everything's authored in either LaTeX or DITA format. You know, you have to have things organized. There you go. And on That's the right. topic of organization, yes. let's talk about frameworks. Let's get into the meat and bones of this conversation, or the do, tofu, yeah. tofu and temper for the vegans out there. <laughs> That's right. So, well, Bill, exciting I times, yeah. That's, mm. we, we got to learn something last week, Robin. The uh, NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technologies here in the States, they just announced their cybersecurity framework 2.0. How about Ooh. that? So all the college textbooks are going to have to change now, right? We, we made a change <laughs> in the framework. <laughs> I guess that's time to start authoring, I guess. Yeah, there so, you go. That's right. NIST 2.0, does this mean it's twice as good? Well, let, let's hope so. I don't mm. know if twice as good, but maybe 20% more. And, and here's why I say that. So for, for those who aren't aware, the NIST cybersecurity framework was originally kind of pushed out in 2014. And the, the stated purpose of it was to help organizations understand risk, uh, learn ways or, or, or author ways to reduce that risk, and then 
find ways to actually communicate that cyber risk. So that, that's kind of really where it was at. Now, most people, when they hear about the NIST cybersecurity framework, if they're familiar with it at all, they'll always think of it in terms of the five pillars. Do you know the five pillars off the top of your head, Robin? I don't expect you to, but... Oh, let's see. I don't. I don't. I have a, a few textbooks going through it. This is all ancient, arcane knowledge now. There so you go. Remind us, what are the five pillars? Sure. So the the five pillars are uh, identify, being able to identify mm -hmm. risk, protect against the risk, respond when uh, risk meets threats, recover from that. And uh, uh, to, to actually wind all these together, the identification, the protection, detection, response, and recovery, bring that all together into a, a continuous motion, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Now, NIST actually listened to the feedback in the industry. Again, this has been out since 2014, so we're, we're getting awful close to a decade of that mm -hmm. framework. And they, they did listen to that. And we were warned in January uh, of this year that there were probably some significant changes that were coming. So what's the significant change? Well, probably the biggest change is five pillars has now mm. become six pillars. So there's your 20% bonus right there, Robin. Ooh. So in addition to those five that we mentioned, they've added a pillar called govern. Now, govern, uh, <laughs> I think, very, very necessary, especially one particular portion. Now, I've, I've actually gone through this document. Govern actually includes things like uh, recognition that there needs to be focus on supply chain. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. pretty important, oh, right? Yeah. Um, it, it, this, the, the whole framework was originally designed, the, the expressed purpose behind it was for critical infrastructure, things like banking or energy, and frankly, it was very U.S. centric. Now, mm -hmm. the feedback that came through was, look, this is something that needs to apply to all sectors. It needs to apply to things like schools and universities. We've talked about that on previous episodes and, and some recent compromises. Uh, it, it needs to take into consideration small to medium businesses and from a U.S. centric point of view, what about things like foreign governments, foreign entities? Mm -hmm. So that's really what they were getting at in, in the changes that are a part of this new 2.0 version. A whopping 52 pages long, Robin. Oh, so that's fun. That's fun. Uh, yeah, it is. It is. So it, it's it is available. Uh, you are able to to go over to NIST and download it. In fact, I, I would encourage if you're if you're in the cybersecurity business. Uh, Take a look at it because they are open for comments. I think the cutoff is sometime in early November, and they provide an email address for you to give any comments on the framework and the, the changes that they have tried to make. The intent is that they're going to finalize this and they're going to publish it in 2024 as, as the finalized version. Now, keep in mind, the NIST cybersecurity framework is not a fully prescriptive framework, right? It's not mm -hmm. gonna tell you how you implement a robust security and GRC policy for your organization. That's really not where it is. It's higher level guidance, it's a methodology. And what I think is really great about it is it provides a language between technical and non-technical folks, mm -hmm. right? Let's make cybersecurity more visible to senior leadership. You know, senior leadership does tend to think in terms of legal risks. They, they, they tend to think mm -hmm. in terms of financial risks. Let's actually bring cyber risk into that conversation, right? Mm -hmm. and, and be able to translate that. Plus, mm -hmm. it, it, it helps you implement other frameworks as well, right? So mm -hmm. uh, uh, any number of them that are uh, extent within the cyber community, it, it helps you to implement that. And pretty soon they're gonna they're gonna actually launch a a reference tool that's both human readable and and machine readable. So yeah. definitely something worth taking a look at. Uh, it, I, I think there's been a lot of great improvements in it. It's it's not a difficult read at all because again it's not fully prescriptive, um, but I, I I think it's it's very powerful. 
So if it's aimed at the non-technical audience, let me use some typical business terms. Let's just double click into this and, and look <laughs> oh back to try and hit some of these low hanging fruits and yeah, that's right. ensure that we're synergizing. So it sounds like <laughs> this framework, if you're not familiar with the NIST CSF, a cybersecurity framework, um, would you say it's targeted at CIOs, CTOs instead of more implementation folks? Well, I think it is, but I think it's trying to make that common framework of, of language between those levels of the organization. So, uh, and, and that is bi-directional. So if you're thinking of it from the perspective of, you know, technical hands-on, we're implementing security controls, it provides a framework by which those efforts can be tied into what the business is trying to do from an executive perspective. Conversely, from the executive perspective and knowing the the elements of, of governance, risk, and compliance to which we have to adhere, we're able to have a language that can then filter down into those technical individuals that help us to begin to identify the types of controls that we can put in place and, and the ways mm -hmm. that we implement those. So uh, it, it, is it written from an executive level? Well, to, to some degree, yes, but there's also sort of that lexicon in between mm -hmm. that lets us translate up and down the stack. Indeed. And adding this sixth pillar, it yes. echoes what we've been talking about now for over a year, Bill. We have. Cybersecurity should be addressed at the board level. It should be addressed as a business risk. In sure. the past, cybersecurity was seen as an afterthought. It was seen as a cost to the business that goes through IT or GNA. Um, however, the more breaches that happen, <laughs> the bigger a problem it becomes. And That's if right. you're not discussing cybersecurity, if you're not describing or discussing cyber governance and going through the full GRC stack at these high C level and above conversations, you are doing yourself a disservice. And if anything, you're hope opening up more and more holes on your network because there's not enough business buy-in. That's right. So with ad adding this sixth pillar, do you think more and more companies will now start taking cyber more seriously? Or do you think it would be disregarded until people pick up updated textbooks in another three or four years? Well, I'd love to think that they're going to take it more seriously because they're going to have that common framework to be able to talk. Listen, mm -hmm. the, the one of the pieces that I called out earlier in the, the govern section is that secure supply chain. You know, it, it came as a real shock back in the mm -hmm. solar wind days that a compromise could take place <laughs> through a trusted supplier, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that was shocking. And, and, and we were, you know, completely unprepared for, they're relatively unprepared for that, uh, that, that violation of trust, so to speak. And, and we've mm -hmm. seen it in, in numerous examples that, that we've given through, uh, you know, through our various episodes, Robin. But that, mm -hmm. I think that really is the intent, not only from the perspective of that common language, but remember, they're trying to expand the scope of the framework away from being very us centric away from being that critical infrastructure definition into a much broader framework so we'd like to hope that by increasing the accessibility and the relevance of the framework that you're then going to see a, a corresponding increase in awareness and maybe an opportunity to begin to address this all from a risk perspective whether it is from a technical hands-on uh, point of view or the point of view of an executive that is concerned with the business and its compliance and and reporting to stockholders, uh, for example. Very, very important. But the, the I think mm -hmm. the ultimate lesson here, Robin, is that just like technology, frameworks need to be able to evolve as well. They have to be mm -hmm. able to evolve. As our understanding increases, we need to be able to evolve. This is a, a constant race back and forth, right? We, we talk mm -hmm. about this all the time. The old world of, you know, from a technical perspective, things like static appliances, you know, the set and forget, uh, <laughs> you know, idea that's, we, we know that that doesn't work. And it's the same thing from a GRC perspective. We have to evolve as our understanding grows. So those, mm -hmm. those old static ways, they're, they're just not sufficient. The risk landscape is evolving. We need to be able to evolve as well. And really, I think the hope here is that by the expansion of this framework and the increased awareness that it's going to bring, we're mm -hmm. going to see much, much stronger adoption. And folks are going to realize that security is more than a cost center. Indeed. So let's just cycle back a, a few steps. Sure. And let's put this into practice. Now, imagine I am a brand new CIO. 
I have just taken this role. It's the first time I'm ever a CIO. And I've come across this NIST cybersecurity framework. Yes. Can you explain to me how do I use it as a framework to make things better? If it's not prescriptive, if it's not telling me exactly what to do, then why is it beneficial to me? Yeah, I love that question. So if you get a hold of the document, you're going to see this. There's a rather lengthy preamble that kind of explains the why behind the document. But mm -hmm. as you continue along the document, it begins to break down those six pillars into sections. So very specific sections. And although it will not tell you prescriptively how to do it, it will tell mm -hmm. you that in the category, for example, of uh, uh, of, of identifying what are the areas that you can potentially address almost like a checklist? You might call that prescriptive. It's not, but it at least gives you those areas where you need to begin to look. Taking that information gives the kind of the back office security staff the ability to begin to map to what the business is trying to achieve. And after all, that's really what we're looking for. So to me, that's kind of the meat of the framework is those, as it begins to break down those six pillars now, it, it gives you functional areas to address in order to make it complete. And what's great about those functional areas, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, is those functional areas may be opportunities to snap in other frameworks. Uh, kind mm -hmm. of thinking in a modular uh, framework here, Robin, which makes sense because not every business has to concern themselves with things like PCI DSS or, mm -hmm. or HIPAA. So mm -hmm. from that perspective, it gives those attach points for those other frameworks, but gives you that, that, that common language and that comprehensive uh, framework of, of items to consider as a part of your risk posture. Uh, absolutely beautiful for that. So my recommendation, quite honestly, is if this is something that your organization wants to adopt, and it certainly is worth looking at, take that list and utilize that list. Go through like a checklist and, and identify, have we covered this area or is this a potential area for improvement? Now, here's the caveat. Mm -hmm. We have to be careful. Because if you if you begin to look at all of this in isolation, Pretty soon, you have an unwieldy set of tools and policies and trying to coordinate all of that. I, I mean, I can just hear, you know, human resources thinking, oh, how many people are going to have to hire in order mm -hmm. to, to address this new framework? Well, the answer to that is look at it from a comprehensive standpoint and begin to identify not only what does our business posture look like, but... How do we cover as much of this as possible with something mm -hmm. that provides a unified security posture, weaves all of those pieces together as many as possible, and then be able to tie that directly to the business so that we can demonstrate due diligence and due care. That's really, mm -hmm. to me, where the rubber truly meets the road. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's the opportunity, Robin. Take the framework. Take the 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 way that it spells out each of the pillars and the, the different functional areas within each pillar, and then begin to identify. Here are areas that we have in place, you know, heat map it out. Here are areas that we have covered. Here are areas where we are significantly exposed. And this all based upon our business's risk profile. Mm -hmm. So with the risk profile, if we know where we're exposed, but there's been a breach event, there's been an infection event, where does the incident response plan fit in with the cybersecurity framework? Yeah, remember, this is cyclical, right? So if, if we look at identify, protecting, detecting, responding, and recovering with governance, right? And that's what's kind of unique about that pillar, that, that governance pillar, is it's, it's an overall pillar, so to speak. Whereas the other five, we tend to think of moving in a kind of a cyclic fashion. So incident mm -hmm. response is a part of that detection, respond, and recover portion of the original five, which we then take back to identify and protect. And this is an ongoing basis. So really, this is evolutionary. This is maturing your, your, your resiliency, your, your security posture, and doing that constantly with the business in mind. That's the disconnect, Robin. And you called it out right at the beginning. The big disconnect is having a business understanding versus a functional and tool-based understanding. How do we mm -hmm. unite those with a common language 
And, and that's what we're trying to provide here. So incident response, very much a part, even of those original five, now all the more from uh, with the governance perspective as, as that over overarching pillar, uh, it, it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. So if this is the first time, listener, that you're coming across the NIST cybersecurity framework, Cato Networks does have materials to show how we map uh, in accordance to the cybersecurity framework. But as Bill called out earlier, there isn't, it is, well, it's not prescriptive. There's not a direct one-to-one. -one. There's not a checklist saying thou shalt do and thou shalt do, but more of a higher level idea. Well, so the more, you, the more you look at each individual function, don't lose sight of what you're trying to achieve. Don't let a framework or don't let a set of guidance and instructions blind you from operational function. As security practitioners, we all have to play that very delicate line between functionality and security. Yes. Sure, you can lock your employees' laptops down to the point where they can't execute any files and think that's super safe and super secure. But if they can't do their jobs, then uh, security at what cost? There goes your productivity. That's right. Indeed, indeed. So on that, that point, Bill, thank you for your time and uh, I'll catch you next week. Pleasure as always, Robin. Thanks. Bye for now.